Kevin Stecco is the founder of 80stees.com. He was doing e-commerce back in 1999, before you could even buy a domain name. He started on this free website and I had him on the channel, I talked to him recently, about how he started his business and also a couple things related to e-commerce. One, we talked in depth about licensing deals, how to get big brands like He-Man and Paramount Pictures to agree to work with your company including what that costs and the minimums that they expect. We also talked about how he generates clients for his business through Facebook, how he does Facebook advertising, how he does SEO. A lot of really interesting stuff about the t-shirt business. And we also talked about margins, like how to figure out what the right profit is. We talked about some innovative strategies he's using to find whales, whales, so like clients that'll pay 15 times more than his average client. A lot of very interesting stuff. So stick around because here is my interview with Kevin Stecco from 80stees.com. I found Kevin because I was searching around for some sick vintage gear. You've got an insane SEO presence. You've got this amazing domain name. I'd love to, I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, so I mean, I think the SEO presence was uh, in the beginning dumb luck, and probably now is uh, a lot has a lot to do with the age of the domain and, and the fact that we've been doing things uh, right for a long time. The dumb luck part is just that when I started the website, I didn't even really have any idea what I was doing, so I had to organize my files in a way that made sense to me. So I named things like I put a folder of uh, for my collection pages. There was a folder called '80s movies T-shirts, <laughs> and for my and then there was one for '80s cartoons T-shirts. And then within there, there would be Top Gun T-shirts and uh, so on and so on. So basically, where when everyone else that was doing e-commerce was running these data database-driven websites with these uh, cryptically generated URLs where they had you know a bunch of numbers and, and symbols in them, we were we were all manual and and very human readable as well as search engine uh, optimized almost by default. So that's kind of how it started. And like I said, that was, that was pretty much dumb luck because it was a whole lot of work to do. Uh, once we figured out that it worked, then we continued to do the whole lot of work happily. But, uh, you know, at the beginning, of, it, it wasn't anything like I had some master plan. Because 1999, I mean, they didn't even have GoDaddy. I don't even know how you would buy a domain back then. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, is um, so I, I technically did start the business in December of 1999. I was using a free website host, and I was uh, since I was bootstrapping and I didn't really have any money. I I didn't even have a domain until March of 2000, uh, and so basically my domain was 80ts.hypermart.net because Hypermart was a free host, so I was just a subdomain on their on their site. What made you want to get online then? Versus, I mean, did you have a warehouse before, or like what was the? How did this come about? So basically, there was a there's a theme park in in Pittsburgh area called Kennywood, and uh, it was pretty common for for me to take a trip there at least once a year. And um, the one year I wore a He-Man T-shirt that I bought in at, up at my uh, town in college, and like six different people kind of like came up to me and asked me. So that it wasn't even like a hey, that's a cool shirt, man. It was like, where can I get that shirt? Or where, can, where did you get that shirt? Those type of questions. And uh, whenever six people did that, I kind of like thought, wow, this is crazy that no one really knows where to get this. I know where to get this. And uh, so I was like, you know, maybe I'll throw some of these up on eBay. Uh, so I made, I made a deal with a guy that at the store that I bought it from to buy in bulk, which when I say bulk, I think I bought like six shirts or 10 shirts or something like that. And uh, he, he gave me $5 off his retail price. <laughs> And I uh, threw the first one up on eBay, and I got uh, – it. the auction went for $30. And I was like, wow, there's something to this because, you know, people you – know, there were multiple bids on the thing. It wasn't like just someone decided to buy it. It was that people were competing for this T-shirt, which I think is kind of crazy now and probably would not happen today. I think the whole auction dynamic is um, – it's cool for something that's rare maybe, but, you know, for a T-shirt that's almost infinitely reproducible, <laughs> it's kind of a silly concept. So I run a – a designer fashion company. It's not really collectors or 80s, but I did actually try to sell a vintage tee on eBay recently and we sold it. But like the, how do you deal with the profit margins? Like you were saying, you got $5 off this price. Is this a good way to, to make money? Well, yeah, I mean, that was, we, we all, so whenever I, I originally I was, I was um, paying 13 
And uh, at, at that time, I forget exactly what my price is. I think I even wrote up an article about this, but I think it was like $24 is what I was charging whenever I was paying 13 uh, when I when I eventually actually launched the site and wasn't just doing eBay. Um, so I mean those margins aren't aren't terrible. They're not they're not really good if you have expenses. As long as you have the bulk, I guess it's fine. I kind of don't feel that way anymore. Um, you know, there's pretty much one company on the internet that that can use scale to their advantage, and you know that's Amazon. And everyone else, the scale is so pitiful that they're really not. It's it's really not going to be competitive. And I and I'm even referring to companies like a Macy's or a JC Penney type of, you know, what would be multi-billion dollar retailers, but they, they're they just dwarfed in scale by so much that they're not going to be able to compete with Amazon in any meaningful way. So to me, I feel like you just need to have really healthy margins and keep your expenses really low. So we, we did raise our prices significantly a couple of years ago. And there's a lot of people that think we're crazy for what we asked for a t-shirt. And um, that, I mean, and to an extent, I, I see where they're coming from, but we, you know, I, I just decided that We'll, we'll keep our keep our costs low. If we lose those sales, then then so be it. Because you know, having a sale where you're only making three or four dollars of actual margin makes zero sense when you consider that the, the most efficient you can possibly be is, isn't going to make up for three or four dollars. Like you know, you're you're get, you're getting tons of little slices of the pie taken away from you by the credit card processing, Shopify fees. Obviously, if you're paying to do outbound marketing, which which we do a fair amount of that, then uh, you know, you have to cover those those costs. So it's it's just uh, it's death by a thousand cuts. And I, I feel like if you don't if you don't charge a lot, you won't be in business very long. It seems like you have to cut. You have to keep everything low. Meaning, even if you spend an an hour, you couldn't even really spend that much time on customer service, going back and forth with people without destroying your margin. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, generally, you could almost consider it, if you have to do customer service on an order, um, if you, if you probably destroyed your margin, if you. If you have to do a return, you've probably destroyed three orders worth of margin. It's tough business if uh, whenever you're talking low price e-commerce. But that's like I said though. I mean, our prices I did raise them significantly, um, and it, it, like I said, it has cut our customer base down. But our average order value is way up. Uh, our customers, ironically, or I don't know if it's ironically or this is to be expected actually, but our customers are happier. And um, I don't know if it's that. You know, if, if someone's paying more for a shirt, that means they kind of value their time more than trying to find the lowest cost version of it. And they're probably in a better place financially, which, you know, leads to probably a, a, a smoother life, if nothing else, and, and less stress and, and probably happier. So by default, we almost end up dealing with overall happier people, I think, just because our prices are higher than a lot of our competitors. I found that same thing. People complain so much more when the price is lower, even for the exact same quality shirt or the exact same quality. We sell services, so the same quality service. Yeah, it's it's it seems to be a universal truth. And I, I, that's my philosophy and my theory on why it might be is just that these people aren't stressed about every dollar. So they, you know, they have some freedom to be happy because if you're worried about, if you're worried about your next paycheck coming in so you can pay bills that, that you're required just to live, you don't have any cushion at all, then you know, that would be a very stressful lifestyle. And I think that would then make it so that if a t-shirt company messes up or, or if the t-shirt doesn't just knock you off your socks, then, you know, your, your happy happiness level is, is going to be even lower. Yeah, for sure. The, um, you said earlier you were doing outbound marketing. What is the, what's the marketing look like for ADCs? Email and Facebook in terms of like actual spending time and money. Facebook being Facebook like, ads or groups yeah facebook it? ads okay facebook ads um i mean we put a lot of effort believe it or not into our organic posting and we actually do see sales from our organic it's a lot of work but the reason we put so much work into the organic is because um we found that that's a really cheap way to see what we should advertise so rather than um you know back in the day it was everyone used to like do the dark posts or whatever um rather than having a dark post where the first time it's ever being seen is is with a paid spend we generally most of our ads i shouldn't even say most i think it's all of our ads start off as a public post so whenever that whole thing came about of um facebook showing showing all ads that a page is running a lot of people were kind of freaking out because everyone's like oh my competitors gonna be able to see what i'm advertising and i was like well it doesn't make a difference to me because you know we're, we're always public with our posts in the first place on the email side do you mean reaching out to your 
newsletter subscribers or is there outbound for direct customers that you're trying to go after? Newsletter subscribers. It's funny that you say though, um, like the direct customers, I literally, and so this is just an experiment. I don't even know if it's going to work very well, but um, I just, I, I told one of my employees, I wanted her to spend some time just going through our best customers, looking at their past orders and then pretending like we were running a store and we knew that customer really well. And they walked in the door and you would say to them, I'm so glad you're here. We just got these new things in that I know would be perfect for you. And then taking them directly there. So like, we're going to take that same approach with email where I'm literally going to have an employee spend time sending a one-to-one email to that person. Have you seen the reality show Sloppy's World on Netflix? No, I haven't. So he sells vintage 80 and yeah, 90s yeah. tees, but there's a couple episodes where he does that. Like he's got these customers that come in or he'll even go to their house and just give them all of this stuff. And it seems like, I don't know how real that show is. It's probably pretty fake, but they seem to buy everything he gives them. So, I mean, there's definitely something to that of picking the items you think these customers will like, maybe even from other stores, who knows? Like maybe they want some real like crazy collectibles or something that normally you wouldn't sell. That's an interesting take. Yeah. To be so generous to your customers that you don't even care if it's your sale, but I bet you anyone that would take the time to do that would develop quite a relationship. One-to-one to current customers. Cause the other way I would, what I originally thought you were talking about was like identify maybe influencers that have uh, expressed interest in like eighties or nineties tees and then offering them rare stuff via email. Or Instagram or something. What you're talking about seems a little better because you have the data already. It's just, um, I mean, since we've raised our prices, it's it's kind of weird. Like we we uh, and, and this never used to be the case to the extent that it is now. But we have like whale customers where they'll place just these orders that are 10, 15 times the average order value. Sometimes 20, 30 times the average order value on our on the site. And um, you know, so those people obviously are, are worth the time. You know, it's like the, uh, the the literal whale, where the whale used to be. Oh, this guy placed a nice order. It was three times the average order. Now it's just so far out of the out of the range that it justifies spending that spending that time giving them that attention. Now you can do all this research and figure out is it is it a lawyer somewhere? Or actually, do you have this data? Who is the whale? What is like the customer profile of this person that's buying fifteen hundred dollars in eighties tees? It's crazy. We we sometimes look into them and I've, I've not come up with a single, a single profile. And sometimes we'll, you know, we, we have their address obviously. So we'll like do a reverse lookup search. And actually a lot of times the first order that they place that's that big, it kind of raises like, you know, potential credit card fraud alarms. So we, we're, we're not just voyeuristically looking at their, trying to look at their house on Google street view or anything like that. We're literally trying to see, does this make sense? And, and, you know, you have to be careful. You don't want to just, accuse you don't want to accuse someone of of anything and you want to if if you're trying to verify you want to be you know sensitive to the fact that if this is real it's an amazing customer so you you've got to be uh you got to be careful how you ask them things that say well something look kind of suspicious so we we do as much research as possible about contacting them um but yeah i mean they'll they'll be nice some really nice houses and sometimes they're just you know average houses and uh, it's just a guy that really loves t-shirts and you know uh his wife or girlfriend or whatever is down with the habit <laughs> so he gets to spend his money on that it's just it's uh there's a whole mix but it's definitely i, I mean i can i can certainly say it's not like they're all going to mansions or anything like that yeah that's really interesting i guess what am i picturing now i'm picturing the guy from 40 year old virgin whose house is filled with the toys like that would be a normal guy he's in a normal house um and he collects this kind of stuff yeah, yeah, totally true. Yeah, they spend their money on on that kind of stuff. They're not really worried about the whole, you know, giant house showing the wealth off with their property or whatever. Have you been trying a bunch of different marketing tactics and nothing's working? I would love to work with you one-on-one to figure out exactly what's wrong. Whether you're using cold email to get billion dollar clients on board, like I've done for most of the Fortune 500 for our clients, or you're using YouTube videos. We have over 23,000 subs, so I know something about that. Or sales strategy, sold millions and millions of dollars in business to business transactions. If you're dealing with issues in any of those, I would love to have a one-on-one consulting call with you. You can get more info on that at experiment27.com slash consulting. The other thing I really like about your business is it's not like you're taking the easy way. Like I've seen a lot of e-commerce stores just kind of uh, violate copyright laws or just kind of rip off their own 80s. But 
every single thing I saw from your store, it seems like it's officially licensed. How do you get those? How do you handle those? So there's two ways. And throughout the business, the majority of our sales have come from shirts that we have suppliers where they obtain the licensing agreement and then they they sell to us. For a period of time, it was really important for us to get our own licenses direct because we just uh, we would have certain categories that we couldn't get enough or in some cases couldn't get any officially licensed things. So for instance, our very first ever licensing agreement was in 2007 and it was with Paramount Pictures for Top Gun and um, Top Gun and Ferris Bueller. And the reason we had to do that was because the company that had the Top Gun license, they uh, they didn't, you know, they made like three shirts because they're, they're concentrated on selling to, um, you know, Walmart or Kmart at the time, that whoever whoever would put that in like a national mass retailer. And so so we, we obtained the license and we had pretty much done that steadily since. But over the past couple of years, in order to keep my expenses down, I have actually dropped all but um, a couple of licensing agreements. And the, the reasoning um, is that with direct garment printing, which is what allowed all those bootleg sites that, you, that you're kind of inferring about to pop up, uh, with that, it's no longer as big a deal to have a design. So if our suppliers that go and get licenses, they could literally have 300 pieces of officially licensed approved artwork. And so to give us a, a large number, to give us access to a large number is not a big deal anymore. Whereas in the past, it, it was a much bigger deal. So. Are there any companies you found that are surprisingly easy to license? Because here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking there's probably some companies where they are very protective of their license, like uh, only giving it out to a couple of companies. Are there any you found that are, are surprisingly easy to get? Anyone that gives me a license, I feel like becomes <laughs> really easy for everyone, everyone else to get. <laughs> That's another reason we got out of it because I would be like, oh, you know what? There's no, you try to use an example. Uh, there's no, he, there's not enough people that have a He-Man license. That was a really important one for us. And as soon as we got it, like three of our suppliers got it. And it's like, well, geez, if I didn't know now what's going to happen then I, I never would have bothered in the first place because three suppliers having it w would provide us ample products. What does that let you do? So can you make He-Man merchandise now or do you have to, do they have to approve it or like, what does that look like? Uh, well, we let our He-Man license expire um, because we have suppliers we can buy from. But um, so having the license is, it really only gives you the right to say, Hey, here are some designs of t-shirts we'd like to sell. Will you approve them? And then if you're lucky enough that they approve them, then you can uh, move forward. But surprisingly, some some companies are super, super strict to the point where it's almost like their their branding is, is meant to have zero fun added to it because they're protecting the brand. Um, and at the time, He-Man was definitely one of those where there were some popular YouTube parody videos with He-Man and they wouldn't let us touch anything that sort of like referenced those. And sometimes I think it's it's just the people that are in, involved because now five years later those shirts we would have loved to have made are actually out there and officially licensed, so we're actually able to sell them now. But yeah, I honestly um, I think if you're not a professional licensing company or you don't have a super unique product that you know is going to crush it, you're you're better off when you can buying licensed products from someone else if you're in like you know if you're if you're selling something like a t-shirt or anything, but um, you know, if you're if you got some crazy widget that you know that by slapping a logo on it would sell better, by all means, I think obtaining a license is a good idea because especially since if you're the only one that makes that widget, there you're really likely to get the license for a reasonable guarantee because it's new money for that intellectual property company. But for T-shirts, it seems like. I mean, they could map out what the guarantee should be pretty well because they, they most likely have other partners. What's that usually look like? So let's say you're an indie t-shirt company or, or you're you guys or whoever. You reach out to one of these brands. What would you expect to pay them for the right to start designing stuff and even, even just start to get into that approval process? I found that at least when we were approaching companies, for many of them, 10000 was the magic number per year that they would they would even consider on the guarantee side. So you're basically saying, I'll pay you $10,000 in royalties per year, which typical royalty on a t-shirt is anywhere from 10 to 12%. Although actually that, that number is creeping up as companies um, are finding that they can go direct more. So they, they demand more of a percent of the sale. But um, 
So yeah, you're you're basically saying I'll I'll guarantee you're you're offering a guarantee. You're saying what is my time period that I'm willing to do this in? So you know, um, you'd want a two year agreement. You're offering ten thousand dollars per year guarantee, and uh, you'll have a sales territory that is it could be the United States, it could be North America, maybe it's worldwide, and then you'll have your product type. So you know, t-shirts. Maybe you want also sweatshirts and tchotchkes or whatever, like uh, the tumblers, something like that. Pretty much have to specify everything that that's going on, um, and and then there'll be consumer safety stuff that they're going to make you have. They'll be they'll make you have uh, insurance in terms of like uh, liability, so that if someone I don't know someone chokes on your T-shirt or, or whatever, you know, uh, can, the consumer gets injured, they're gonna they're gonna sue the T-shirt company, they're gonna sue the licensing company, they're gonna sue everybody. So you have to have insurance indemnifying the intellectual property company. And then you have to submit your designs. And because the licensors sort of want to justify their reason for having a job, they are going to say, no, you got to change this. <laughs> so then you got to change it. And, you know, I found there's some that are worse than others um, that, you know, they, they really want creative input. And at that point, it gets very difficult going back and forth and the timing. It might take you a month to get approval on a design. If you can kind of tell, I'm, I'm a little bit down on the whole process just because yeah. there's so much work work to it. It seems like a strong bet too. Like how often how often do you lose the 10k that you put in? I've had licenses that I was upside down on the royalties for sure. Where uh, you know instead of at the end having um, to pay them extra money because I you know I met and exceeded the guarantee, where since I've already paid it, the, the agreement ends and basically I'm like, well, I never actually submitted enough or got enough sales to cover those royalties but it doesn't matter i don't you don't get that money back i'd say like 20 percent of the deals i did ended up being that way i mean that's not too bad though 80 percent of the deals 80 percent of the deals you do you you end up at least covering the licensing fee i mean if someone was going to go yeah. out there and just grab a bunch of licenses but you're so down on it so what what turned you off of these licensing deals and what are you doing instead i mean basically what turned me off is is for one thing since i'm retail and since i do have higher prices I'm paying them 10% on the, the what the customer pays. So if I sell a t-shirt for $35, then you know even at 10%, that's $3.50. Whereas if I buy the shirt from a company who specializes in getting licenses, they're going to pay the royalty on what I pay to them. And uh, let's you know say I'm paying them 1150. So their you know their royalty is less than half of what I'm paying. So it actually ends up being cheaper for me to buy from them. And so it's just it's just so much better for me to work out like some exclusive arrangements with with them and uh, like I said because of DTG they're more more willing to do that now than they were originally. Oh, that's interesting. Well, they so my original thought on that was I guess it sucks because you can't do your own original designs, but I guess you can pitch the company that has the license. Like I guess you can you can do original designs through that company exactly. instead of going direct. Yeah, that's right. It's not it has nothing. How do I say it? Just because I don't have a license doesn't mean I can't have an exclusive T-shirt. And then even before, whenever DTG wasn't as popular, we would get exclusive designs. But the general uh, requirement was like you're going to order 300 pieces every three three months or six months, and the second you don't send that order for 300 pieces, this exclusivity ends. Whereas nowadays, you know, they can have they can take a design, modify it a little bit. And it's uh, exclusive to us. And, you know, the only expenses they're incurring are those approval process things. Um, and actually samples, too. That's one thing I didn't even mention. Um, some some companies require a ton of samples. So, like, uh, you know, Marvel Comics, I've heard, I've heard you might have to do, like, 50 samples to send to them to get approval on a T-shirt, which that adds up in the cost if you're trying to do you know, a ton of designs. What are yeah. they checking when they when they want fifty samples? Oh, I think they just want to pass them around the company. Honestly, <laughs> uh, you could check it. You, you could check it with one sample. There's there's nothing that, you know, you you could argue. Well, we just want to see there's consistency across the product, but fifty is totally unnecessary for that. Probably three. I put it this way: the the one of the most frustrating experiences I ever had was for Christmas from one of my licensors. I received a goodie pack, and in the goodie pack were five of my T-shirts. So basically, I was I was supplying them with their uh, you know like little goodie packs they could send out to their customers and stuff. So what are the next steps for 80s tees? What are you what are you trying to do now? Like what marketing channels are you super uh, pumped about as well? Yeah, um, I mean I still think 
Facebook can't be beat in terms of just their targeting ability. Um, targeting ability combined with the medium, the Facebook post ad unit, there's never been anything like that where I can click a, a like button, which takes me zero effort, and it provides distribution to people who have been my, you know, have decided to be my friend on Facebook, or I can comment on it and the same thing. You know, imagine a magazine ad where the customer thinks something to themselves and the brand can respond. I mean, that it's it's almost like magic if you think about the way advertising used to be. So yeah, I, I think that can't be beat, and they are. It is getting more expensive, so it's harder. Uh, and, and scaling is much more difficult, but Facebook's probably my number one. We actually are trying to launch 90C relatively soon, hopefully at least in 2019. So that's that's a big undertaking. I don't think it will ever be as successful as ADC because in the 90s, the media started to fracture, which um, you know, media is totally fractured now in terms of Netflix has 100 kids shows, Disney's ha- Disney has 100 kids shows, and and Nickelodeon and all these companies. So if you're trying to sell kids apparel based on, I mean, even I feel like you could go, you could go as late as maybe like 2004, 2005, like 2004, when we we got like black eyed peas, you could probably do like music stuff. Everyone was kind of looking at the same stuff. And then nineties, you've got like MTV, but yeah, I totally see what you're saying. Nineties is like the matrix. Yeah. Stuff like yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. There but I know there's still have a, lot, a lot of shared stuff, but I mean, the eighties was like, if you're talking Saturday morning cartoons, which we sell a lot of cartoon stuff, you had CBS, you know, you had your uh, CBS, ABC, or NBC. And that was it. So people were watching Smurfs basically. So everyone saw Smurfs whenever it was Saturday morning. And and the lowest rated show on a Saturday morning in 1983 probably had more viewers than like an episode of The Walking Dead today. <laughs> And that's probably not an exaggeration. So do you think vintage is going to go away? You already said after the 90s, it's kind of it gets harder and harder. What do you think the future is of, of vintage clothes like you sell? I always thought there was an expiration date on my business um, because I thought people will grow up and they'll grow out of this thing. But we've had this awesome geek culture thing where it's been embraced and uh, there's no longer a stigma. And uh, you know things that may have been considered childish things or purely nostalgia are now back in the mainstream and, and staying there. So I, I think that like the things that I sell are still going to be popular in 20 years. And I, at one point this seemed crazy, but I can totally see a 60 year old man 20 years from now, like myself, like I would be sporting a Ninja Turtles t-shirt. Like, I don't, I don't think that's going to be crazy. A crazy thought. I would wear a matrix tee. It's like a cool one with like Neo. I would even wear a tee with like the poster of the matrix. Like talking nineties, yeah. even like Panic at the Disco. I would wear like a Fallout Boy or like a emo band style T shirt. No, yeah, right. totally. I, I, I think that will that'll happen. Cool, Kevin. Where can people go to check you out online? So, I mean, if you want to get my like philosophizing on e commerce, I actually have a personal blog at kevinsteco.com, which I don't post often enough. But um, I I kind of like go over some of my business strategy stuff. So. Uh, I think that's a pretty interesting place if people are geeking out about e-commerce. But then obviously, adc.com is where we sell our products. And if you want to see our marketing stuff, uh, if you don't follow a Facebook page or something, because like I said, all of our posts are where we end up end up paying money on. And uh, you can also subscribe to our emails, although to an extent that there's there's not one – you can't like subscribe to our email and know that you're getting all of our emails because we do try to segment them out and, and uh, give people different stuff. Cool. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Running a cold email campaign is one of the easiest ways, one of the most straightforward ways I've found to get new clients. We've used it to match with most of the Fortune 500 for our agency clients and a lot of billion dollar brands we've been able to sell. We've generated millions of dollars of revenue just from cold email. The problem is if you've tried cold email, it's not as straightforward and as easy as it looks. But luckily, we have put together the cold email optimization checklist and you can have it for free. What this is, is the internal tool we use to optimize our cold email campaigns. This checklist will teach you or your team when to rewrite the subject line, 
when to rewrite the body of the email, what to put in the body of the email, how to check the email to make sure there's no errors before the send goes out. All of that in a very straightforward checklist and you can have it for free. To get it, go over to experiment27.com slash checklist and you can have that download. Again, the URL is experiment27.com slash checklist.